wrong mic. Sorry, our next speaker for today is uh, Rahul Kulkarni. Rahul is the Chief Product Officer at Socrati. And I think it will be quite an interesting talk about uh, how targeting is done in advertising. Thanks, Adam. Alright, let me go on. So, uh, my name is Rahul Kulkarni and the uh, CPO at Socrati. Socrati is a digital marketing and analytics company. So, we are about a four year old startup. Our DNA is very much analytics engineers. So, started by three ex Amazonians who returned from Seattle, um, set up base in Pune and started Socrati. Uh, I joined from Google about 10 months ago. Um, so whatever we do is very much analytics. Uh, most of the large e-commerce players, finance players are our customers. So what we basically do is we run ads on Google, we run ads on Facebook, we run ads on display networks, on YouTube and so on. Um, a lot of experience in ad targeting. And where this comes from is, you know, it's really hard telling twins apart. And I'm really hard with uh, differentiating faces, uh, especially in weddings when somebody comes and recognize me and I'm always completely blank. Uh, ad targeting is so much more an easier way to kind of differentiate between people. Uh, forget the names and forget the faces. Um, uh, we can deal with cookies, we can deal with behaviors. And those are very, very distinct. So what I want to do today is walk you through uh, three things. And we have a short amount of time, so I'm going to stress on three big pieces. One is, how does the whole cookie story work? Uh, how many of you are familiar with how ad targeting works, how cookies and ads work? I'm sure most of you would be. Uh, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll keep stretching uh, the level of difficulty here and uh, give you some hope to give you more insights on how the cookies work uh, in terms of the way ads are targeted. Um, second part I'd like to uh, give you a dose of is what are the variables involved in ad targeting? Um, now, yes, there is one cookie. But based on that cookie, then you're going to derive a lot of other variables, whether it's the color of the ad to the interest of the user and so on. So let me give you a run through of what those variables are. And now when you toss all of these variables in the mix, that's a big data problem. Lots and lots of data. We literally um, have two billion records getting into our database every month. Um, so it's a huge amount of data. How do you, this is not about just getting the data and being happy. This is about now using that data, processing that data to actually target these ads to the right users. Um, so that's the most important step. So I touch a bit on that in terms of how does the targeting happen? How do we manage this big data? What techniques do we use? Give you a small sneak peek of that piece. So to start with, um, simple question. So here I go to Engadget and I'm reading through this blog and then after a couple of minutes I switch to TechCrunch. And then I see the same Engadget ad there. Anyone tell me why this is happening? Retargeting, re simple. So this is retargeting, very basic retargeting, which is I go to Engadget's website, Engadget um, throws a cookie on me, which um, TechCrunch then, some ad network there, has this container which looks for that cookie, saying, hey, this guy was an Engadget, it's the same guy, it's the same guy, and shows me an Engadget ad. Um, so that's how basic retargeting works. Now let's take that a step further. Um, and uh, here let me give you uh, uh, some detail on how much you can target with retargeting. This screen, anyone familiar with this screen? Um, this is from Google Analytics Remarketing. So this is part of Google AdWords, a very powerful uh, tool for remarketing. So if you throw your analytics and remark uh, remarketing cookies, you have this kind of screen to create a visitor filter. So you can create these buckets. So right now I said, hey, this is the guy who came to Engadget, show him this ad. You can actually give a lot more variables there. And what you can do is you can say, 
hey by dimension you say revenue that of the product he was looking at is greater than $100 um, what else can you say you can do sequences so you can say this guy first added a car product to cart and then removed it from cart and then added it again I want those kind of guys you can actually target those as well so uh, there are a lot of very powerful ways you can slice and dice these cookies based on a simple UI um, now let's see something further another use case I go to Forbes.com and I read up some real estate articles whoa REIT is getting tough um, is it a good investment for retirees and so on I'm browsing this on Forbes then I suddenly start getting these ads I see some housing.co.in ad and it knows I'm in Pune and it's showing me listing I've never even heard of this site. I've never even gone to housing.co.in. Um, I see some Southbees International Realty. Um, whoa, I'm never even going to buy there, but I cannot. And at the same time, I've never heard of them, but I've not gone to them. Remember the first scenario? I'd gone to Engadget, and it was simple retargeting. Here, I don't quite know, right? Uh, completely out of the blue. And yes, I was looking up some real estate articles. So it kind of makes sense, but I just don't know the math. Uh, how did this exactly happen? Let me explain that piece to you. So the moment I went to Forbes, there were 30 cookies dropped on me. Bomb of cookies, right? Just cookie, 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 cookie. Uh, how many of you use Ghostry? Ghostry, amazing, amazing plugin for Chrome. Just uh, search for Ghostry plugin, G-H-O-S-T-E-R-Y. Uh, it gives you the number of cookies being dropped on your machine at that point and you can block and you can selectively block those. Uh, so the cookies that get dropped here um, are uh, from a wide variety of players. Some are analytics companies. Um, so Forbes want to, wants to track uh, oh, how many people are sharing this, how many people coming to this and so on. And then there are the blue guys and experience and data logics of the world. These are data exchanges who are dropping cookies to profile customers. And um, this, this piece, how does this work uh, in terms of if you do a uh, control U on the, any page, if you do a control U on this fourth page, it looks a very normal page. But there'll be one little .js file, some link, which would in turn look as crazy as this. Actually, this is a, uh, the source of the Pubmatics um, cookie file that they throw in. And in turn, this one file, this one JS file would fire away a bunch of requests. So um, one request that you think is one request in turn turns into 30 requests and that's how those 30 cookies get dropped. Uh, could be done by multiple of these cookies. So that's cookie piggybacking. Um, so you throw one cookie, you can throw more cookies. And it's a matter of convenience. It's also a way of um, tailoring this for the user. At the end of the day, uh, a lot of these companies, most of them, have these privacy rules set well. Uh, no personally identifiable information class, blah, blah, blah. Uh, stick to those things. And it makes the experience better for the user on the internet at the end of the day. Um, so these uh, cookies that are dropped ultimately are passed on to advertisers. I'll, I'll show you how that's done. So I'll take the example of BlueKai. So Forbes is a BlueKai partner. What's BlueKai? BlueKai is a data exchange. Um, so what data exchange means is they have a bunch of these partners. Forbes is one of them. So all those um, uh, partners right there on the left, uh, some um, a block sites, some uh, data exchanges themselves, and so on. All of these these little icons next to them, what they signify is what type of user cookies are they making available to BlueKai to sell to the open market. Now, these cookies, uh, these are types. So all of these users that go to all of these sites are being classified as um, either people who like finance, people who like real estate. You know, there's even political affiliation. You can say he's a Democrat, he's a Republican. Uh, you could say things like, okay, what are the last uh, things that this person has bought in the last 30 days? Uh, remember, no personal information, but something that tells you about their behavior. Something that you could make an educated guess on in terms of uh, thinking about how to target this person. All of this 
uh, gets categorized into all of these cookies get categorized into different buckets and say, oh, this is my retail bucket, this is my finance bucket, this is my um, uh, political affiliation with this party bucket. And all of these go into uh, Blue Kai, which is a data exchange. From there, Blue Kai shares that with hundreds of ad partners. So these are uh, places where ads are shown. So you would have the Google double click, you would have um, a lot of these different uh, folks like AdRoll, AdMeld, and so on. Uh, now they would actually display ads. And that's how the connect is made. So finally goes from the publisher, uh, which is Forbes, um, in detailed terminology that's called a SSP, a supply side partner, uh, goes to these data exchanges, ad exchanges, ad networks, and demand side platforms at the end of the day. So that's a kind of how the life of a cookie traverses uh, in terms of getting you this information, passing it cross-site. So when you say, whoa, how did you know I'm interested in real estate? That's kind of what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, and this is just one flavor of it. Um, there's uh, a bunch of ways, you know, cookies uh, go from here and there. So that brings me to the second part of the talk, which is the variables. So what are these variables? Now. Um, uh, there are a lot of things that uh, happen in terms of how do you target a user. So when you're doing advertising, you have to know who your target audience is. Just like when you're doing sales, you need to know whom you're going to sell. Uh, when you're doing marketing, you need to know whom do you want to reach out to. Uh, now given a lot of these um, cookies around, given a lot of even Facebook offers you a lot of um, options to target people. You can target by age, by interest, by employer, by um, uh, fans of, by your connections, and so on. Um, in Google Display Network or other display networks, you can target by interest, by the context of the page, by the interest of the user. Uh, Gmail sponsored ads allows you to target based on what's in your inbox, and it's about the user, not about the content. Um, so a lot of these things have a lot of parameters in terms of targeting. What we do at Socrates is simplify this into user personas. So we have something called the Socrates persona identification, where uh, we use a combination of these. So some are um, intuitive um, um, correlations that we have made over the past. Um, some are hard data from cookies, where we say, oh, this is uh, this um, interest corresponds to this intent, and hence we make some conclusions on what that person would buy. Um, Again, remember, so we at Socrates, we are always on the advertiser side. So we never share cookies. Um, it's um, only for that advertiser. So when we are authorized to collect something from a advertiser, we only use it to advertise that advertiser's products. Um, so every company has kind of their own internal policy on how they want to use cookies. So let me give you a quick example. So you have uh, to give you a sense of what kind of data uh, flows in and what kind of parameters need to be captured. So here's a user, he comes to Google, searches for a car, sees an ad, clicks on an ad, ends up on, a, on the page. Now assume this for a single advertiser. We deal only with one advertiser at a time. We're completely blacked out from the others. So when this is one advertiser, um, let's say the advertiser sells cars and cats and monkeys and everything. Um, so the user searches for a car, clicks on an ad, comes to the site expresses interest there. So we kind of know, hey, this user interested in this keyword, interested in car, comes to the site. Right? We show that info. We just know this one user. Now, we throw more ads on Facebook, and we don't know if it's the same guy or not, but somebody clicks on an ad for a cat and comes to the same website, but lands on the cat page because it's a cat ad, right? Now what happens is, because it's the same computer that the cookie was dropped, it's the same cookie. So we would know that it's the same guy. Now we know the guy likes cats and cars. It's the same person. Now the person also does something on the website. Right? So the person could browse through cats and cycles and some education stuff. And we know, okay, this is the guy who likes cats, hats, education, and so on. Now let's say he goes ahead and purchases a cat. Right? If he purchases a cat, we tag him as a purchaser of cat. But do we show him? Now, most mistakes that common, uh, most companies make is, great, he purchased a cat, let's show him more cats. Like, so wrong. Uh, he's not going to buy a cat. He's going to buy the other things he browsed through. So now the thing to show him is the car, is the education thing, is the little cycle. Right? That's how you're going to get him buying more. 
um, or you show him scat accessories. That also works well. So we see this day in, day out, and uh, these common strategies um, finally have their core in terms of what is the persona that you're targeting. Let me go through other variables quick. Um, the ad content is very important. So we always try multiple variations in ad. Uh, you would think of an ad as an ad, but uh, not quite. You know, when Snapdeal has 200,000 or plus products, um, or uh, India Times or a Flipkart, you know, big companies, big sites, a large inventory, all of them have so many products in there. Um, you can't really tailor make ads for each one of them. At the end of the day, you have to figure out, okay, these are the product lines that are selling. I'm going to have multiple variations for these. And so what we do is do try out variations across products. Now, variations involve the background color, important. Um, variations involve the text, of course. Um, the text is important, especially on Facebook. Uh, you know, if you're targeting a married man and you have, an, uh, have a headline which says, have, what is the last time you have surprised her? You know, it evokes a response. Um, if you have, the picture needs to be matched as well. So if you have an ad creative which has a picture of a couple with a headline saying, what is the last time you have last surprised her, targeted and married men, maybe 30 to 35, it just works. The CTRs are far higher than any other targeting that you do. Um, so it's a combination of these background colors, these little images, the text that you show in and so on. Other piece is seasonality. Uh, there are certain products that get sold um, within a span of one hour, you know, first click to the ad, down to the last purchase. Um, so recharges are that example. You, know, you click on ad, you're searching for online recharge for idea, and then you click on it, you come to Paytm, like, oh, great, Paytm, awesome, let me click and let me make the sale. Uh, five minutes from ad click to lead. Um, versus you're buying a TV, and you're going to do a lot of research and a lot of research. Smart TV, smart, smart TV, super smart TV. And you're never going to buy it for at least three months. So um, the, uh, the time before which you have to wait till the actual uh, lead materializes is a lot more. Um, the seasonality factor is huge uh, because there are certain things you buy in certain seasons. Now seasonality, just don't think in terms of sun, moon, uh, wind there. Uh, it's also in terms of uh, festivals. It's also in terms of downturns of market. It's also in terms of, hey, you would be looking for that weekend getaway with your girlfriend towards the end of the month when your salary is in. Um, and uh, there are certain things you would do when salary is see shown in your bank account. There are certain things you would do just before the week that salary is going to come in. You do things just before you're going to hit your bonus. Uh, and all of that is seasonality at the end of the day. Um, so that's another element that you need to keep in mind. Um, the whole color palette, not just for the ad, but think of the color palette for the placement as well. So what we often do is look at the colors, the primary colors in the placement page. So you have thousands of placements, right? We have uh, these algorithms to figure out, okay, um, uh, let's get all of these placements, let's figure out, oh, there are black uh, pages there, black background pages. You know, white ads are going to do well, uh, not dark backgrounds. And so how do you use that as another variable in this whole mix? So that's kind of some of uh, a brief taste of some of the variables. Uh, primarily for targeting in terms of the interest, there's a lot of things in terms of the ad creative, and a mix and match of these is what uh, creates a good ad. Now coming to the third part, which is the smart targeting piece. How do you actually make sense out of all of this? So great, you captured all of this, you have all this data. And you know, from a big data perspective, you're like, awesome, dude, this is super. I have two billion records in my database, and you're all happy, and you're touting it and everything. And that's really good, but how do you use it? Um, so I'll give you uh, one technique that we use. So here, there's uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of audience segments, like we talked about, the user personas. There are these hundreds of products that we could potentially sell to the person. Um, then there's hundreds of combinations of these, the ad creatives and placement. Um, so if you try and do uh, you know, a combination of this 100 times, 100 times, 100, you're going to run into a lot and lots of combinations because you need to map the persona to the product, to the creative, to the placement, and so on. Uh, typically, it's a, uh, you're looking at combinations. Um, so A times B times C. So there are two ways of doing it. Let's say you had even, even consider just three variables, uh, each having 10 variants. 
So you have 10 times 10 times 10, 1000 combinations possible, right? Um, now what happens is if you, um, the options that you have is, forget it, let me just say these 10 variants won't affect anything, just target 15 to 45 age group, all females. That's uh, one way of going about it, where you say, I know jewelry is only going to be bought by females. And maybe you're just making a big mistake because maybe there's that 30 year old male close to the anniversary who's going to do something. Um, um, and if you don't try, you would never know. And so it's a mistake sometimes making these broad um, um, assumptions, kind of just to save that one ad or the creation, the process of creation of those thousand ads. The other thing is you could go highly fine grained. You actually launch all the 1000 ads, right? Even that's prohibitive because 1000 ads launching those manually on Facebook, extremely prohibitive, not happening. So what we do at Socrates, we use uh, good old design of experiments. How many of you remember design of experiments from school, right? So controlled experimentation. It's a very proven statistical technique used all over the place. We use it very heavily in terms of ads and ad targeting. Um, so you use design of experiments. What's de what design of experiments does is it says, um, and I won't get into too much detail, but it says, hey, if this is a cube, this three-dimensional space and the three dimensions, you give me values for this and this, I will tell you what the values for these two are. You don't need to do combinations to get me these two values. And if you give me this and this, I'll tell you these two again. And so just getting these four values, I'll get you, you know, eight or ten values uh, together. And so then when you multiply this a lot, so what happens is 10 times 10 times 10 becomes 10 plus 10 plus 10. And so just with 30 combinations, you are able to conclusively say what variable had the most effect. So if you, for example, say, I'm going to try an ad for married men, married men, 18 to 20 with a cat and let's say it worked. Now you don't know if the cat worked, if the man worked, if the 18 to 20 worked or even the location worked, you know, that's a big one that uh, always exists. So you launch a bunch of these, let's say you launch 40 of these, with lots of combinations, male, female, age group changes, location changes and so on. And what design of experiments does is it spits out those 40 so accurately that if you take scores of those, you would very conclusively be able to say male works or 18 to 20 does not work. Um, and that's the beauty of design of experiment. So overall, you know, it's, it's always shown us that it crumple, uh, it, um, it con uh, condenses these combinations that we have into various options. So you say, okay, this persona, we have only to show it to these three and this. And at the end of the day, what we could do then is we have scores for every variable. Every little variable there has scores. So you say, oh, this person, I know this guy. No, he's orange, he's okay, you know, neutral. Oh, this thing, totally red, he's never going to buy. Uh, this apple, totally red, don't even think about it. And so a lot of these variables just get eliminated like that. And based on that, what we then do is we say, okay, let's just throw this bucket away. Let's just look at these two buckets. Um, what are these customer sets that are important? So we say marriage is working, male is working, uh, male is working for this product line, female is working for this product line. Uh, hey, for people who want brands, they're working with uh, discounts. You know, people who are very brand conscious, it's kind of counterintuitive, but if you always want to wear Levi's and you are really hung up about the Levi's part, maybe not the quality or the fit, fit and finish of, of it, you really want the Levi's tag on it, you're most likely going to be also very discount conscious. You know, if you get the Levi's at a 50% discount, you're really delighted. And that's what you're looking for. The guys who don't care about the brand there, don't care about the price. And so we've seen um, orders happening where a person's just browsing, he doesn't browse by brand, he's just looking for something or she's looking for something. And she finds that one stole, that bright yellow color, something floral for the summer. Boom, she's going to click on it and the average order size is always going to be higher um, than the brand conscious person. Um, so a lot of these insights come out of all of these experiments um, that uh, get run like this. So at the end what happens very simple, you throw all of this data together, you take the greens and oranges, you say these are the parameters working, you can even slice them and dice them again and what you tend to do is you expand them as well. 
So you say, okay, I got to know that tier 2 CTs is working for me. So tier 2 is my best bet. Now within tier 2, what do I do? Uh, this product is kind of the kind of guys or girls who like Multani Mitti. Uh, now I'm going to say, okay, in Pune, they're attracted by something else. But in Kolhapur and Nandir, they're going to be attracted by something else. So Pune girls liking Multani Mitti is one set. And then Kolhapur and Nandir girls who are going to college, all of them one set. Uh, and maybe that's the same thing. Maybe pe girls who have a Scooty or a Pepe or uh, Activa, you know, those form one set. So a lot of these combinations ultimately get programmed into these ad networks and are thrown across. Um, so that's kind of how the entire process works end to end. Um, a quick snapshot of it. Of course, I've not covered hundreds of other elements in it. But um, in this little time, I thought I'd give you a quick overview of the, uh, the cookie bees. You know, how extreme can it get in terms of how much can be targeted. Um, so, a quick advice for you, you know, when you're doing any marketing, doing any kind of targeting, be smart about it. Um, you can get the right user and users like to have the right ads. All of these ad networks, the Googles, Facebook of the world, um, even I remember from Google days, um, it was always the ad team wanted to have the ad as relevant as the search result. And so it was almost, those were, it was church and state, very separated. and the top search results should be as exciting as a top search ad. And so all of these companies are wanting to make the ads right. Um, companies like us, startups like us, coming to make sure that happens. But at the end of the day, you want to throw the right ad at the right user. So all of it's possible. Um, just ask and just look through the right settings and options. You'll be good. Any questions? Yes, yes. What part of it is real-time, what part is batch processed? Uh, good question. So the question is, what part is real-time, what, uh, what part of it is batch processed? Um, the retargeting bit, um, where you deal with real-time bidding exchanges. So when we throw ads on Facebook with uh, retargeting, that is using Facebook exchange, uh, that is real-time. Um, so whenever you are here to make uh, real-time bids where you say, hey, I got that user, how much, how much are you going to give for him? 5 cents, 10 cents, 15 cents? And literally you have to return a bid which says, I want to give ad 2 if it comes at 10 cents. I'll be okay giving ad 3 if it comes at 12 cents. And these are options given to the exchange and then boom, it picks one and ships one. Um, so anything dealing uh, with um, uh, real-time bidding exchanges is always real-time. The, uh, the cookie collection, the comparison and offline uh, analysis is batch. Uh, it's not as uh, feasible to do that real time, although we'd love to get to that. But most companies do it in batch at the end of the day. What about the time sensitive uh, products which you are retargeting where the lifetime is like 18 hours, 24 hours? Right, right, right. How do you do that? So for retargeting, simple retargeting, um, uh, the batch piece, uh, or sorry, the real time piece is needed. And real time as in near real time. I think even an hour and so it's okay. Uh, it's not like I go to the site and immediately I'm going to see that ad there. Uh, all the layers there, remember we tossed it through an ad network, a publisher's network, then a data exchange, then an ad exchange and so on. Everyone I'm sure has a half an hour at least of a certain processing time. So there's some delays there. Thank you. Yeah? Sure. So the Open Graph search and Open Graph API. Yes. So uh, the Open Graph API, what Facebook does is provides a lot of tools to advertisers like us, um, and provides a lot of options for and defaults, good defaults for users to um, kind of manage their privacy. So Open Graph is only possible. The Open Graph API, for example, is uh, you can really mine it well if the user has opened up API access. Uh, if the user hasn't, then you really can't do anything. Uh, you get minimal info. So you do get name and profile ID and so on. There are some powerful constructs uh, such as that can be connected on Facebook. So there is profile ID. And profile ID is, I don't know if you've heard of custom audiences. It's a feature in Facebook. Um, custom audiences, what you can do is you can give an email list. You can give a mobile phone number list. Or you could give a profile ID list. Any of these three. And you say, I have 10,000 of these. 
What Facebook does is says, great, I found 8,000 of these on Facebook. Now what ads do you want to show them? And you can then uh, put ads on them. So that's a custom audience's regular feature on Facebook uh, with regular bidding. Um, so if you use the social graph API and open graph API, there is a connections targeting available in Facebook. Uh, by connections, it's about as much data you can gather by profile ID. And given the defaults of privacy are off, rightly so, uh, it's hard to kind of mine too much of it. Uh, you won't get too much of profile data. What you can um, get is if you look up um, fan pages. So some fan pages do give you some data. Uh, you know, you may get the likes for a certain cover photo and you'd get the profile IDs liking that photo and so on. Um, so there's some interesting things that you can do. Um, and we do observe some of that when making these decisions. So scraping we stay away from in terms of, um, so we use scraping when it comes to the site that we're dealing with, where we're looking for out of stock. You know, that's one instance where we scrape, where, um, uh, where there's an ad running for the cat and the cat's out of stock. So the website says out of stock and we're driving traffic to it. So what we do is every half an hour we scrape the websites to find out out of stock. Now that is done with permission from the website owner because they are our advertiser. And so it works. But scraping a Facebook or a Google, strongly not recommended because you'd hit a wall in a day, in 10 days, and so on. So the moment you see, hey, it's successful, it's working, you know, they'll shut you off. Uh, and then you get into this cat and mouse game. So um, what we believe is if there are certain rules, you just stick to them. Um, it's easier spending your energies and doing it the right way. And most of the time, there is a good right way. Yeah. Good question. So networks, advertisers, so um, there are two kinds of advertisers. They are the advertisers who are about performance advertising and they are the advertisers who are about brand advertising. Um, the guys who are doing performance advertising says, dude, I want to sell this cat. I have a 20% margin on the cat. You can blow up to 20% uh, on it. You can spend 20% of the MRP of the cat and I'll be in uh, profit. At least I'll break even if you hit total 20%. Get it as low as possible. So it's kind of um, a margin kind of model and it's very performance driven. So they don't care where we show, how we show. As long as you meet those numbers, everyone's happy. There's the brand advertising group which uh, deals with reach and frequency. And uh, they're slowly moving online. So you see the big brands still love TV. They still love print where it's about reach and frequency. The logic is if you keep hammering a person over and over again, so the moment you go to that store and say, I want a washing machine, and uh, the guy's like, what brand? And the first thing that will come to your mind is the last ad that you saw. And so it's about how many times have you hammered the person with that ad and that brand name that you say, aha, I want it. Uh, those are different kinds of customers. And so um, they ask about reach. Uh, so they're the ones who want to do YouTube mastheads and YouTube first watch to block YouTube for a day. So every day you open up YouTube, the first video that you watch will have a pre-roll ad. And many of the times it can't be skipped. That's the first watch uh, roadblock for the day. Uh, so we do it uh, for a lot of clients, especially branding clients. They just want to get the word out. Then they get smarter saying, okay, now that I have the word out, can you hit the same user again with my messaging wherever else the user goes. So now you can you reach that user on a Google display network and so on. So they kind of get that frequency uh, after the initial reach. Um, so depending on the advertiser, yes, they definitely don't like the targeting if you're reducing the uh, customer set too much, if it's a branding client. You had a question? Yeah, what is this kind of technology? So technology is across the board. Uh, so a bunch of them actually on the fifth elephant Bangalore uh, uh, list of proposals. Um, we uh, have all kinds of databases, so right from a Redis to a Mongo to MySQL, um, so on, uh, everything over that on Java. Um, the, uh, we've learned a lot about two surprising things over time that we've seen. MySQL works. You know, as much as we uh, uh, kind of poo-poo it, hey, this is bad, that is bad, 
um, it still works and there are no bugs. You know, Mongo, we've, uh, we've uh, used Mongo successfully and everything, but we've ended up, you know, uploading things and patching up the core source code and doing things like that, um, inventing stuff along the way. Uh, when you are on MySQL, you don't um, kind of need to do that. Everything's there. Um, there's actually a talk about it, a proposal about it, which uh, we're describing, you know, what makes us two kinds of proposals. One is how do we maintain two billion records and still use MySQL. On the other hand, um, uh, in terms of the um, mix of databases, what do we gain by using so many different databases at the same time? Everyone has their advantages. You do need a Mongo, you do need a Redis in conjunction with MySQL in the same system. Um, so that works as well. Um, one another thing is about the um, uh, you know the Hadoop kind of part of it. So yes, when you're mining site data and all, we kind of use Hadoop um, uh, to do things in batch. It can't be that real-time thing. You're picking up stuff and so on. Um, and it's uh, great for archival. That's where you start with. And slowly you realize the power of it and so on and kind of upgrade. Um, but being a startup and everything continuously moving, right? You have to keep the system alive and do this. It's always not a grand switch. So it's a mix of databases and I think it's worked very well for us. Yeah, and for real-time technology, real -time, so real-time, so we use a bunch of networks. Um, so ad exchanges and networks in turn um, for a lot of the real-time pieces. Um, the some uh, real-time pieces that we have our own servers where we uh, shoot things back and forth. Um, so there are um, uh, different kind of elements have these things. So most of these things are batched at the end of the day. Um, where you have say Facebook or Google, you have to toss uh, that, uh, let's say you have to toss a bid or something. It's Google who takes care of most of the hard work or Facebook who takes care of most of the hard work in terms of where it goes. Your ads are already there. It's about you telling him, I want ad number 35. Um, so that's a easier problem. You know, you don't have to deal with CDNs across the world serving ads and so on. Uh, we are not as much on the ad serving side directly. So ad serving per se, as I was mentioning, we don't serve the ad. Um, it's the networks that serve the ad at the end of the day. The, um, uh, the uh, Google display, display network or the ad melds of the world or the content network. What is the RTP filter return? Right. Yeah, so for certain parts, let's say for directly talking to Facebook on Facebook Exchange, for example, that prototype is on um, uh, Java. You know, that's still working on Java. It's, um, it's decent, you know, don't feel the need yet to uh, go to see, but um, it may change, you know, that keeps changing. It also depends on where that so their server is, uh, what is the computation needed on our side. I think the computation matters. So as we get more and more, um, 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 as we do more and more in terms of the computation, um, that thing we are revolving on it right now, Java. Right, uh, good question. So who dictates the policies here? Um, so to my knowledge, there is no very firm law, no very firm central body that actually does this. So every company has its own way of doing it. Uh, what we do internally, yeah, we have a review where we actually look up, um, decide on what are these policies we want to follow. For example, when you have a cookie tossed on someone's header, you could pretty much extract any data, right? Um, but we have very strict guidelines on how to do that. So basically we have a list of all the parameters that we are going to take from the website. We send it to the advertiser, our client, and say, hey, these are the parameters that we plan to capture. Here is how we are going to use it. And here is how we are going to, how much we are going to store it. Um, is that okay? And then the client may say, you know what, no, take off email. I don't want you storing email. Like, sure, fine. What else? Um, take out the time of day. Sure, we take that out. What else? And based on that, back and forth, we respect whatever the advertisers told us. And if you are the advertiser, right? Uh, if you're working with an advertiser, and let's say you have this uh, e-commerce company that you're working with, um, and you have a cookie there where you have uh, tossed a cookie with their permission, actually, they need to put the cookie. Uh, then what is captured? 
uh, is something that you both decide. And that's how it, you come to that. So we, uh, we have strict policies in place on how to ask for that permission from the client, what to capture, how to capture it, um, strict guidelines on flagging it, hey dude, this PII, do you really have permission for it? And then internally, uh, you know, that's probably another talk, but internal security for all of this is important. Uh, we're capturing user data at the end of the day, so uh, access to only certain level and above engineers only working on the project or only on call for that system, uh, we have all of those processes set uh, to make sure the data is always safe. A good question. Uh, the uh, way code evolves, you know, I'm sure everyone's part to it. Uh, it depends on how soon you want the thing out to be. Anything that's critical, we strictly have a very uh, stringent process of code reviews, designs, and so on. Um, in terms of um, uh, the algorithms and all, it's very much a plug and play kind of framework um, where uh, you have ETLs um, uh, running to transform data the way you want it. There are certain processes that happen in batch offline. Um, there are certain things, uh, I'd admit this is not a, a perfectly joint system, right? Let's say you say the first time we did DOE, uh, design of experiments there is, we knew R can, uh, R can do it. So R had a library for it. So we found a library in R that can do uh, design of experiments. And great, we used that. So that ended up becoming a batch process. You say, here are my targeting variables, oops, I need to jump to R to get that output there and now jump back to my system. Um, so yes, those quirks exist, but we tend to make all the interfaces very, um, uh, very crystal clear. And the moment somebody can join it, great, it just flows smoothly. Uh, but it evolves in terms of interfaces. Interfaces is key. Um, you have these interfaces and everyone is a black box. Like right? Three of you are running a project. Don't tell me the details, just tell me what goes in and what comes out. Great, I'll trust you for it. Now, who's next? And then you just plan how the data is going to flow at the end of the day. Cool. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of a silly question, but uh, with a lot of advertising going through mobile, do you have a strategy for that too? Yeah, 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 of course. So um, uh, mobile is, um, is, of course, a really big one in terms of um, ads. There are two challenges with mobile. One is, um, Manufacturers are uh, going away from allowing uh, device ID, UDID to be exposed. So how do you track a unique mobile? Um, most of the, uh, uh, many of the mobile browsers like iOS, Safari and so on, don't allow cookies. And like, dude, what? No cookies? Then what am I going to do? Uh, so um, you need to develop cookie-less tracking. Um, so you need to uh, figure out how do you want to save certain parameters on the server based on what the browser could return you. Um, so uh, advances in terms of cookie tracking for, you know, and fingerprinting. So how do you know the ad that was clicked and the, um, uh, the app that was downloaded and installed? The only person who knows that an app was downloaded is a Google or Apple, right? Because they own the store. Um, and you don't have a cookie there. You cannot target anything there. You just, it's a black box for you. So your only hope is to track it when the app gets installed. And when the app gets installed, it fires a wake-up call like, I'm alive, somebody made me alive. Like, I came from this click from this campaign. Um, so you need to correlate that ad click, which happened in a browser that cannot store cookies, to an app that is installed in the OS of a system. Uh, it's a tough problem, and uh, that's where we are also racking our brains on, um, have good prototypes there, in terms of fingerprinting. Um, the other thing is, how do you do uh, this across devices? So now that you have a tablet and you have a, a MacBook and you have a, a Samsung phone, um, you know how are you going to? Uh, how do you know that it's the same person? Um, so there is a lot of uh, research around that as well. So yeah, definitely we are on it. Hope to come up with something cool soon. Uh, no, uh, so in terms of the mobile tracking, right, or yeah. uh, cookie less, yeah, right? No, I have to say I am an organization. Right. I my to a right. And then that's a challenge. So SSID is out of bounds. SSID would be really cool, right? 
so what captures SSID is uh, apps. So you know, say your Maps app and so on can capture SSID. So it can kind of correlate. Oh, this Wi-Fi router is uh, corresponds to this GPS that was tracked by the same phone. So I know the location of that router. Um, but that those things you can do when you're an app. Uh, you can't do that when you're in a browser. Um, so in terms of browser, you know, IP definitely you have it. But now anybody accessing um, that site from ThoughtWorks would just seem the same person um, if there is only a single IP pass. So there are clearly other parameters, whether it's behavioral parameters, whether it's certain things you can run on the JavaScript, maybe it's the cookie versions or the browser versions and so on. Um, but that, that's the exactly why it's a tough problem to crack. Wait, sorry, I think I'm over time. Great, thank you very much and I'm a travel at Thanks. There are some samosas and coffee finally in the kitchen. Please help yourself. Shashi, you have some. I think there are also shooters also. Down with presentation, something we can put online. Yeah, sure. I'm not at Google now. No, because it's a way of confidence. No, no, I didn't take that out. Okay, okay. So, uh, you like it? This is cool. I know. It's so cool. <laughs> so, um, if you can email this to me, I'll sure, add it. Sure. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll add it to your uh, talk today. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh,